<laughs> so they say. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the kickoff of the fifth year of the Iowa Files. This is a free public education series done in partnership with the West Des Moines Public Library and supported by the Friends Foundation and the Iowa Arts Council. Um, we have another great eight months of programming and we're kicking it off with a fantastic Kate Lavasser. She is a historian. She is expert in 19th century recipes. She is a lecturer on a wide variety of topics from Victorian death to women's rights, which is essentially what her program is today. She is the archivist and tour manager for the World Food Prize, which is another fantastic historical building that you should definitely visit in Des Moines. That's a position she's held since 2021. She also volunteers her time as a board member for the Historical Society, which sort of makes her my boss, so be nice to her, okay? <laughs> She'll also be presenting as part of our second historic cemetery tour, which is scheduled on Saturday, October 7th. And I just checked, there are only 23 tickets left, so um, go ahead and go to our website, wdmhs.org, for more information and to purchase your tickets. So. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us, both online and here in person. And I'd love to introduce Kate. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out this afternoon. Uh, I just wanted to start out by uh, saying I, I would like to dedicate this presentation to Louise Noun, uh, without whom I never would have learned about Annie Savory and a lot of these early women's rights advocates in central Iowa and Iowa altogether, uh, which started when I was researching a, a cemetery tour at Woodland Cemetery. So of course the Savory Mausoleum featured prominently as part of that research. And ever since then, I just keep learning more and more interesting things about Annie Savory and a lot of these other early women uh, activists and reformers. And a lot of that is all thanks to the pioneering research that Louise Noun did uh, within her writing career. So you heard a lot of this already. My name is Kate Lavasser. Uh, I'm currently the archivist and tour manager at the World Food Prize Foundation and spend a lot of time kicking around the West Des Moines Historical Society in various uh, roles, including presenting, um, speaking, and volunteering uh, in addition to my board service. Uh, I'm a local historian, so I love doing presentations like this, helping people understand more about the history of Iowa. I'm a storyteller because that's how history is most interesting to me. Instead of just a list of names and dates, that's not very colorful, of course. And then I'm also an amateur genealogist. So uh, not only my own family history, but basically the family history of anyone that will let me uh, know the birth dates of their you know, parents or grandparents, I'm gonna try to find stories for them. Uh, before we get started, just a little bit of information to kind of ground everyone uh, before we start talking. Uh, first of all, I'm going to make some intentional word choices. So first, you may be uh, familiar with the term suffragette. I'm going to use the word suffragist instead. Uh, like many of you, perhaps, came familiar with the word suffragette um, through not only research, but also the very catchy song from Mary Poppins, Glynis John singing uh, Sister Suffragettes and running around the house with her sash on, um, you know, but actually in the United States, often suffragette, suffragette was used um, derogatorily, especially in the press, especially at the time period I'm talking about um, earlier in the movement. So, uh, for example, the cartoon that you see up there, Nobody Loves Me, Guess I'll Be a Suffragette with a Little Baby Girl. Uh, she's putting on pants <laughs> because, uh, you know, the, it, it's not a kind cartoon towards women that are fighting for women's rights. But the idea is that uh, these women are donning pants, they're becoming female reformers, women's rights advocates, because they can't get a husband. Uh, you know, they're ugly. They're, there's something about making them unable to fulfill what is considered the prime role of women in this time period in the domestic sphere. So that's not what I want our vision of these women to be because that's not the reality. So I, they use the term suffragist or reformer. So that's the language that I'm going to use as well. 
Uh, we also today would say women's suffrage, but you see women's suffrage a lot in the names, uh, you know, in the names of their organizations. So it's not a grammatical error on my part. It's just reproducing the actual names of these organizations or movements that were used in the time period. Uh, I will also just as a reminder that I'm focusing on the early years of this movement. So a lot of the really uh, well-known people, uh, actions that we think of when we think of the women's suffrage movement. We're not, I'm not going to be going much into the 20th century. Most of the time and the, the actions I'm going to be talking about is taking place in the 1870s and earlier. So it's not that I'm not placing a value on these later uh, reformers because they're very important. They're some of the most famous names, but it's just outside the context of what I have this time to discuss in, you know, 30 to 45 minutes today. So uh, I'll, I'll have a few things to talk about to send people uh, for more information, but we're really focusing today on the, the 1870s. So the big question, why aren't women voting besides the obvious that it's not legal? So in the Victorian time period, women are, le are leading the domestic or private sphere. So it's a whole uh, philosophy, a social philosophy going back to even ancient Greece, that there's the, the private and the public spheres. So women are focusing on their household and their family, the domestic sphere, uh, as I said, uh, and how they're supporting their community is through good works, uh, like their church, for example, and volunteering and supporting charities. Uh, women are considered too pure for politics. It will corrupt them and therefore corrupt the family and the fiber of America as they're raising the next generation of leaders. Uh, there's a perceived and actual lack of education or lack of understanding about issues. So they're going to, it's easy to say, oh, well, we don't want those women voting. They don't have the education. They can't make an educated vote about these issues. So don't, don't let them submit that ballot. Uh, there's also a perception that women would just vote the same way as their husbands and fathers. So what's the point of just doubling up on those votes? Let's just have the, the head of household uh, be the one that's making that determination for their family. Uh, there also is concern that women will provide support for temperance legislation or other moral reforms that perhaps men in the community uh, might find objectionable. It's those women that are going in and trying to stop the sale of alcohol, uh, you know, and that that could be no good. So later, uh, this is going to be, out, again, outside of our purview a little bit, but uh, one example that gets brought out a lot, uh, especially once we get closer to the passage of the 19th Amendment, is that women are more likely to support higher taxes. Uh, you know, they especially in regards to uh, an appeal to farmers, uh, there is a lot of uh, statistics very strange statistics in some cases brought out about how in particular women were going to tax, uh, in increase taxes for roads because they don't like to be jostled as they ride around in their automobiles or carriages. So if you give women the vote, they are going to make you repair those roads so their ride is more smoothly as they get from place to place. A little bit of context story on my favorite podcast, uh, History Chicks. They always say, let's drop this into history to make sure we know a little bit about what's going on. All right. And I apologize, that's a little small. But so we're going to head back in time a little bit to Seneca Falls. So really where it kind of all comes to a good start in the United States. So 1848 is when the Seneca Falls Convention takes place. Now, this is the country's first women's rights convention. So notice that that's women's rights, not women's suffrage. So they're not just talking about voting. Uh, it's, it's about education reform. It's about uh, rights for women in marriage, uh, for example. And this is largely organized by Quaker women. Uh, there is a progressive group of, of Quakers in New York around this area. And these Quaker women in this community were particularly uh, educated, their community placed an emphasis on equality within marriage, and they're also looking to be uh, leaders in abolition, the women specifically too, alongside uh, their, their husbands or other men in their family. So this was a very progressive community and was the birthplace of a lot of this 
movement, both towards abolition and equal rights for women too. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was also a major player in uh, the Seneca Falls Convention taking place. She was not a Quaker. That's just why I mentioned her separately there. A couple years later in 1850, we have the first National Women's Rights Convention. So this is what would become the first of an annual meeting, organized meeting, as opposed to Seneca Falls was kind of a, I don't want to say a one-off, but it was kind of the, the kickoff. Everyone's getting together for the first time. And again, focus on jobs, education, wages, temperance, property rights, and more. 1866, so that's our next date. We're thinking about American history. There's something big that happens between 1850 and 1866. Uh, this American Civil War is in there. And so for a lot, uh, a lot of the American Civil War, not everyone stopped caring about women's rights, but a lot of women's rights reformers, since they were also focused on abolition, really pay, have abolition become kind of the, the first priority as they go through the, the 1861, 1865 period. But once... Uh, we get the 13th Amendment when slavery is outlawed and the American Civil War ends. It's time to step up the efforts. Um, and there's a couple other issues at play that we'll discuss here, too. So 1866, the American Equal Rights Association is founded. So this organization is formed with the goal of securing equal rights, particularly suffrage for all American citizens. So this isn't just focused on women. But again, you see a lot of the same leaders in both movements at the same time. In 1869, we have what I am calling the Great Divide, or the Great Rift. Uh, there's some names here that will be familiar to you. So Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton form the National Women's Suffrage Association, uh, which is considered the more um, radical arm of the movement, we'll put it that way, and uh, Stone and House, so uh, they form the American Women's Suffrage Association. So why is this? Well, let's find out. So you can't, as I mentioned there, in this time period, it's really hard to separate out the abolitionists and the, the women's rights activists. So let's take a look at how those two go together. So we have, as I said, the progressive Quakers in New York focus on social reform and justice. And women in particular get experience in organizing, in writing letters, in speaking in the American Anti-Slavery Association, which was uh, started by William Lloyd Garrison, who's a Quaker. Uh, so this wasn't the same across all abolition groups. There were some groups that said, oh, thanks women for supporting us, but maybe you can do our mail, <laughs> you know, like more administrative tasks that would be womanly. Uh, Garrisonian groups tended to allow more active participation. Uh, some women unable to participate in abolition work shift their focus to women's rights. In fact, the whole reason Seneca Falls comes about is because uh, some of these early reformers went to London in 1840 to go to an uh, international abolitionist convention and they weren't let in because they were women. So they said, oh, well, in order to do our abolition work, we clearly need to do some work uh, to be viewed as equals or to be able to participate uh, on this stage at all. Uh, focus on racial equality, as I said, Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony were actually neighbors and family friends. So there was a lot of time where uh, not only were they working on both, but they were meeting together. There was a time when uh, these early reformers wanted to actually start or merge their organization with an anti slavery but the anti slavery organization said, no thanks, we're going to keep focused on our. Um, in 1865, as I mentioned, the 13th Amendment is ratified and slavery is abolished. Uh, some abolitionists at this point, this is where we start getting some, some rumblings of that rift, some abolitionists advocate for a shift away from women's suffrage work until African-American men are granted suffrage. So you have some abolitionists saying, whoa, it's not that women's right, you know, women's suffrage isn't important, but now that we have these former enslaved folks or African-American men have or African Americans have citizenship, we need to work together to make sure they have voting rights. And maybe that's our priority in giving women the right to vote. In 1868, the 14th Amendment is ratified, African Americans are granted citizenship. And in 1870, the 15th Amendment is ratified, African American men are granted the right to vote. I put an asterisk there because it's a complicated issue. We head into a lot of um, 
voting laws or uh, Jim Crow, for example, uh, Reconstruction era policies that worked very hard to stop African American men or African Americans in general from voting. So saying African American men granted the right to vote, very broad statement, that's the intention, but I don't want to leave that you know, as the final word on, on that topic. So with that, we've got the passage of the, uh, the African-American citizenship and this potential tension and real tension about the priority of women's suffrage. So these two opposing groups have both strategic and ideological disagreements. So the National Women's Suffrage Association, or the NWSA, formed by Anthony and Stanton, it's primarily female-led. So most of its officers are, all of its officers are women, um, and they opposed the 15th Amendment as it was proposed. So they said, this is no good. We want suffrage extended to women and African-American men, all of us together or nothing. We've all been working together on this project. We all need to come in and get our suffrage extended at the same time. So they're more radical and controversial, and their work is really extending beyond suffrage to incorporate all those, uh, those I say projects, but the other rights, wage reform, education that we mentioned, uh, they discussed at Seneca Falls and that first Equal Rights Convention. The American Suffrage, Women's Suffrage Association, formed by Lucy Stone and Julia Howe, has both male and female leadership, so it's, it's echoing some of those Garrisonian abolitionist groups. They're focused on universal suffrage, so suffrage for everyone, votes for everyone, and they really keep that focus fairly narrow uh, to just focus on voting. Spoiler alert, they do mend <laughs> their disagreement and later in 1890, merged to form the National American Women's Suffrage Association. So it's not a rift that lasts forever, uh, but there is that separation in the time we will be discussing. Okay, so that's on the national level, what's happening here in Iowa. So after the all amendments take place, we should have as well. So in 68, the Iowa Constitution is amended to remove white from the sentence regarding voting. Male is left in. So everyone was very concerned about that. And the you can see the article there is from the Tipton Advisor. Uh, so it talks about the, basically says the Constitution with the word white stricken out in the sections above enumerated would provide that every male citizen of the United States of the age of 21 years Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, shall be entitled. All so, as a result, of that, we get the first suffrage society in Iowa in 1869. The Northern Iowa Woman Suffrage Association is formed in Dubuque. Uh, after some of the suffrage head across the border to listen to uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton present a talk in Galena, Illinois. Uh, so the activities of the club are sponsoring events. Uh, they also host Elizabeth Cady Stanton for a talk as well. I appreci uh, appreciated this particular article from uh, the Morning Democrat in Davenport because it starts with enterprising females. Enterprising females, women of Dubuque have organized a Northern Iowa Women's Suffrage Association. So, um, and when you see announcements for the meetings, they always say, make sure you let us know if you'd like to come. <laughs> you know, they're encouraging people to come to these meetings uh, and spread the word. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of early suffrage leaders in Iowa by any stretch of the imagination. So if you have a favorite that didn't make this list, I apologize. Uh, but we have Mary Newberry Adams uh, born, and I included their birth and death dates just both as biographical information, but also because it's really, and we'll talk about this later too, to, it's interesting to see that none of them, as you might expect from how long people live, you know, ended up seeing women actually getting the vote. So they do all of this work, uh, but many of them are, are passing away well before uh, the 19th Amendment is passed. So Mary Newbery Adams helps found the first Women's Suffrage Society in Dubuque and is particularly an advocate for women's education. Amelia Bloomer, 
uh, one of my personal favorites. She was publisher of The Lily, which was one of the first uh, abolitionist and then women's rights uh, newspapers. And this was when she was still living in New England. She was an early advocate for clothing reform. So that's where we get the bloomers. Uh, she didn't invent them, but she was really big on women having practical clothing to go about their life. Uh, she gets worked in with Iowa uh, reformers because she moved to Council Bluffs in 1855. Uh, so she spent a lot of the last, uh, the, well, she spent the end of her life here in Iowa working uh, both here in Iowa and with leaders in New England to help uh, promote the cause. Uh, Martha Callanan was publisher of the Women's Standard, and this was a little after uh, we're talking, again, after the 1870s, but, and mentor to Carrie Chapman Catt. Uh, Mary Jane Cogsall was a spokeswoman for early suffrage expert, uh, efforts, excuse me, and was one of the only Iowa, if not the only Iowa, early Iowa suffragists that was active as an, at the national level, as in she wasn't just attending conventions, she actually served on a bo the board um, of the NAUSA. So that was that group that again, once they came back together and she was the first editor of the Women's Standard. And then Annie Savory, my favorite, I'll admit my bias, a speaker and advocate for women's suffrage and equal rights and one of the first female graduates of the University of Iowa School of Law. So, what do we have to do in order to get the vote in Iowa? So the Constitution has to be and just like it was to allow African-American men the right to vote or Native American men as well. It was anyone that's not white, uh, any man that's not white. And in order for that to happen, it has to pass twice. So two subsequent uh, calls of the, the, the legislature. So in March, 1870, the Iowa legislature approves the revo the a resolution to remove mail from the Iowa Constitution. And next time it would be up for approval would be 1872. Uh, so in Louise Downs' uh, article on Annie Savory, she notes that this action was taken without any pressure, organized pressure from suffragists, largely in response to the goading of the Democratic minority. So what does this mean? They didn't do it because they had women that were saying, this is great, we need to vote and here's why. And then the politician, the, the men uh, in power said, you're right, I see the light. You're 100% correct, women deserve the ballot. It was because the Democratic Party at that time said, you know, I can't believe that you would give the right to vote to African-American men without giving the right to vote to your wives and daughters. So they passed it, the Republican led Congress passed, or Congress, uh, State House here passed it because what does it really mean to pass it the first time? It still is going to need a second passage. So as much as anything, it's a symbolic way to say, oh yeah, well, we're going to think about <laughs> maybe giving the vote <laughs> to our wives and daughters. So. Leave me alone. <laughs> so it's, it's largely can be seen as a symbolic move. Um, but of course, there are men, Republican legislatures, there are men that are pushing and do support women's suffrage, but it's also a way to get them off, you know, the backs of those that are opposing it too, saying, okay, sure, we'll let, we'll pass it. We see that there's an appetite for this. And then we'll see what happens in 1872. Um, Amelia Bloomer and Annie Savory were among those in attendance uh, when it was passed. After this, we get the first state convention in Iowa, and we see an increase in suffrage activity. So the first convention is held in June of 1870 in Mount Pleasant, and it was called by Quaker Joseph Dugdale. So again, even away from New York, we have Quakers leading the charge for these reform movements around the country. The Iowa Women's Suffrage Association is officially formed, and Iowa Attorney General Henry O'Connor was elected president. Amelia Bloomer was elected one of seven vice presidents, uh, and Annie Savory was also elected as an officer. So it was worth noting that Amelia Bloomer was the only attendee with any sort of significant organizational experience in these kind of groups. And in letters she wrote, she was suffering from a lot of ill health at this point in time. She almost didn't even go. Uh, she said, Great. I, mean, I paraphrased what she basically said, great. No one else there even knew what to do. So even though I'm really tired and not doing well, I'm going to have to step up 
to help lead this organization since I'm the only one that knows uh, how to go about this. Uh, the, de the decision was made not to affiliate with either of those national organizations because of the tension between the two, but both groups were in attendance, had representatives in attendance going, oh yeah, who, who are you going to decide with? Are you, are you going to be deciding with the uh, association or the National Women's Suffrage Association? So uh, it's definitely a group that the National Association is keeping an eye on. And the Polk County Association founded in 1870. So both of those groups together, and uh, it's important to note that they are definitely distinct groups with their own personalities. The next big thing, the next big issue coming into uh, the suffragists' lives in this time period is Victoria Woodhull and the free love movement. So free love to us, we might think more of the 1960s or, or hippies when we think of free love, but that's not what we're thinking of in the 1870s. Uh, so Victoria Woodhull herself, there's a picture of her uh, taken by Matthew Brady. Uh, she was a controversial lady. She was a former medium, so she traveled uh, the country as a magnetic healer and then a spiritualist connecting people with the spirits of the dead. Uh, she actually also was a brokerage firm operator. She and her sister opened their own brokerage firm on Wall Street and an early newspaper publisher. So um, she's actually an amazing woman who accomplished things that other women weren't even dreaming to. But because she had this kind of the this part was a spiritualist medium uh, and this free love uh, aspect, which we'll talk about, uh, she became a very scandalous and notorious figure. So the free love, she's a proponent of free love, which is, at this point in time means the freedom for women to marry, divorce, bear children without social restriction and government interference. So what does that mean? She's saying the resulting here basically is women can get trapped in marriages. Their husband, you know, is the head of the household. They don't have a lot of legal recourse if their husband is abusive, if their husband takes all the money and, and drinks it away. Uh, if he's just not a nice person, there's not a lot a woman can do about it in this time. Even her children, a lot of the time, belong to the husband if she were to try to leave. So the idea was the free love proponent said, that's not right. Women should have the right to be able to extricate themselves from marriages too. So easier divorces, uh, They should. you shouldn't have to get, you know, society raining judgment down upon you if you have a child out of wedlock. You know, it's it's things that are both very, just a step away from being reasonable in this time period to being completely off the moral charts. And guess which things that mainstream society is focused on. They're really looking at this movement as immoral, being to lovers outside of marriage, just do whatever they want and completely undermine, you know, this, fabric of American society. Uh, so that being said, she was one of the first women to address the House Judiciary Committee, and she did so in 1871. With the, She was try, basically explaining to them, to the Judiciary Committee, why the 14th and 15th Amendments gave women the right to vote. So there were some ladies that loved this about her, uh, particularly uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, they said, this lady is a great speaker. She has passion. She's educated. She knows what she's talking about. Um, and Victoria Woodhull was dollars to significant. But of course, as I said, this is easy mission for those opposing women's suffrage. Uh, conservative suffragette, suffragists say she is living in her house with her ex-husband, her current boyfriend, basically, and her business manager, and she's not married to any of them. Uh, and she's had all these crazy jobs that no woman should be allowed to have, which again, those jobs, the women said, great, stockbroker, publisher, we love her for this. Uh, so the American Women's Suffrage Association keeps their distance. Uh, and really the, the thing that was making th people like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton mad is 
that there's basically a sexual double standard. So men can go and do whatever they want and no one cares. They're still allowed to have leadership or, you know, in, in organizations and their businesses, they can still be respected members of society, but you, you pretend to be a medium for a few years and live with your boyfriend and suddenly you're completely incapable of these, these jobs. So obviously my own paraphrase there, but there's, that's the, the thing that they're most objecting to. And how do Iowa suffragists specifically respond? Again, opponents frame suffragists as immoral and pro-free love. Uh, the, I, the, so the Iowa Women's Suffrage Association, President Henry O'Connor and others take the time to step away from the organization, back away slowly, stop involving themselves. So it's up to Annie Savory actually steps up to take temporary leadership and immediately starts butting heads with more conservative members of the organization, uh, especially at the county level here, uh, particularly Nettie Sanford, who was from Marshalltown. She was a reporter and she, Nettie Sanford, insisted that the Iowa Women's Suffrage Association needed to condemn free love and Victoria Woodhill and make it very clear that that was unacceptable. Otherwise, no one would ever take them seriously and anyone that was not condemning them clearly was an advocate for free love and was immoral themselves. And Annie Savory and Amelia Bloomer more, uh, more moderately say it's a separate issue. Free love and suffrage are being mashed together, but they're not the same thing. They're not connected and we need to treat them as separate issues. And frankly, Annie Savory said, we should be welcoming anyone that wants to help us, anyone who's passionate about this cause. The door should be open. We should be inclusive. We shouldn't be kicking people out and saying that they're not, their contribution doesn't matter just because they support free love. So the Polk County Women's Suffrage Association goes ahead to condemn Woodhull and free love and denounces Annie Savory and Amelia Bloomer. The, the state level organization promises not to denounce anyone because of social theories or religious affiliation. So we have even a further split here in Iowa. So the Polk County women specifically say, no thanks, free love is bad, anyone that's not on our side condemning it is also bad, uh, and the state this level group says no we're gonna we're not going to judge people based on that and anyone is welcome one of the things i also particularly appreciated annie savory saying is everyone got mad about i shouldn't say everyone opponents got mad about the national groups accepting the ten thousand dollars from victoria wood they said that is immoral money you can't take that who knows what she was doing to earn that ten thousand dollars and immediately of course Amelia or Annie Sabre, a lot of the other leaders, what? That's never stopped the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or abolitionist groups or anyone else from accepting this money and doing good with it. If she chose to give us $10,000 that she earned, even if it was dubious, then that's probably the best thing she could possibly do because we are going to do very good things with that money. And this cartoon that you see up on the screen is... Uh, actually, if it tells you just how bad things were with Victoria Woodhull, this is Victoria Woodhull as Mrs. Satan, uh, holding a sign that says, be saved by free love, while in the back is a woman with baby strapped to her and a drunken husband on her back, saying, basically saying, no thanks, I'm much better off miserable settled with a bajillion children and a drunk husband than I would be following you down the path of, of free love. The artist was a man. <laughs> okay, so we get to 1872. It's time for the second approval in the Iowa legislature. At this point, again, Bloom, uh, Amelia Bloomer and Annie Savory have been basically kicked out of the at the county level of organization, but they still want to attend the General Assembly to speak in favor of the suffrage uh, amendment because everyone's seeing that the tide is, is kind of swinging away. It, it doesn't look good for approval at this time period. Uh, but the Polk County Association makes it very clear 
that they are not interested in anyone from the state level organization speaking on behalf of the suffrage movement, not just them, the suffrage movement at all. Uh, so that Amelia Bloomer says, okay, she steps back and says, okay, I, I won't speak if that's, if that's the, the perspective or if that's what the Polk County uh, organization wants. However, Annie Savory does not <laughs> decide to take a step back. Uh, she, it's still very important to her that she speaks in front of the group. And so her colleagues, her male colleagues that are uh, the senator's representatives, they say, it would be better if you could find someone that opposes suffrage to introduce the motion to let you talk, to show that it's not just all of us as cronies. So uh, Annie Savory asks Senator Richards from Dubuque, who is a well-known suffrage opponent, to make the motion because also he says he's a really big proponent of free speech. So they said, well, this would be a good way to test how big a proponent of free speech you actually are. And uh, Senator Richards says, of course, I'll introduce you and make a motion for you to speak on the floor. Great. Well, he does indeed make a motion for her to speak and also asks his fellow senators to vote against it within his motion. And of course, everyone says, OK, <laughs> and she's voted down, so she is not allowed to speak. So Annie Savory, as well as members of the Polk County I say, I say Polk County Association just to make it a little bit shorter. So the women of the Polk County Women's Suffrage Association, they all start writing letters to the Des Moines Register because that's you know, how, how you handle it to get your word out to a, a wider audience. Uh, so the Polk County women, again, assert that they are not willing to support or compromise with free love advocates like the state association and were therefore opposed to of any speech making taking place, especially Annie Savory. Uh, Savory, on the other hand, she never personally attacks any of the women on, from the Polk County group or any of the other suffragists. She again condemns the double standard of morality uh, and opposes language and thinking of women as angels instead of people that live in the real world with actual problems, because that's one of those things with the domestic sphere. And I have uh, up here, I have the article that Louise Noun wrote about Annie Savory. So if anyone wants to read any of the actual um, letters that Annie Savory wrote in there, they're in here. But basically, of course, Rich, Senator Richard says, you know, this is this is terrible. If we approve this, Iowa is heading, you know, downhill into terrible moral territory. Uh, you know, we must keep again, women at home, at pure, where they can help uh, be the angels of the home, uh, helping raise, uh, you know, our next generation. And, and Annie Savory makes some comment about, like, women, the dust that keeps getting kicked into women's eyes is blinding them to the reality of just how bad their situation is. Uh, March 29th, so a week after the speech was supposed to take place, the measure loses with a vote of 24 to 22. So it's a very narrow loss. Uh, I'm, this is maybe, it's adjacent, but I wanted to make sure to mention the Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, in this conversation, which takes place in the, in the following this time period, not as a result of, but uh, temperance and suffrage are also closely linked, just like we spoke earlier about abolition and suffrage being linked. So many reformers, both male and female, support the temperance movement, placing the blame for many of society's ills on drunkenness. If we stretch this back into the 1820s, 1830s, it's called temperance, not because they're trying to completely eliminate alcohol, but because they're just avoiding it in excess. Uh, so that's how it started. And, and really, it's in avoiding excess in anything, not just drinking alcohol. But by the time we get into the 1870s, the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, say, uh, you know, no alcohol whatsoever. But the temperance movement is especially important to women because they are the ones that are particularly affected by you know, drunkenness or uh, overindulgence in alcohol. Uh, their husbands might be losing all their wages or spending all of their money at the bar and not having any to bring home to help pay for food, medicine, housing. Uh, and then of course, physical and emotional abuse of both wives, family members, and children, so vulnerable family members. So it's really women that are 
charge, and, and male allies too, uh, that are taking up the charge for temperance, whether that means less alcohol or no alcohol whatsoever. The Women's Christian Temperance Union is established in 1874, both nationally and here in Iowa. And it was actually Keokuk, Nita, and Woodmeyer that served as the first national president. And as I mentioned, they took a firm no liquor stance and really encouraged women to write to their legislators a lot. <laughs> the more letters you send them, the better uh, to ban the sale and manufacture of alcohol. Uh, many of the unions, they called even local groups unions, uh, took up other social causes, including suffrage and prison reform, and especially juvenile delinquency, uh, being against juvenile delinquency. And this was seen by many as a less radical way for women to uh, fight for suffrage and enfranchisement. Uh, just checking in with uh, the leaders, so Amelia Bloomer joins the Council Bluffs Union when it begins because uh, temperance had always been an issue that she felt very strongly about and was something she had been advocating for since early on in her life. And Martha Callanan uh, here in Des Moines worked very closely with uh, the WCTU and other temperance organizations and social reform. I just want to make it very clear, while I am very pro anti slavery I'm not saying that the Polk County Women's Association was evil or that they didn't do good things, because that is not true. Um, the organization actually worked very early with African-American suffragists as well. So uh, seeing how they could work on incorporating African-American women into uh, the suffrage ranks as a whole, instead of just having them be two separate movements. Uh, so it definitely isn't that I'm saying they're bad. I'm just saying this was a very fractured time in the movement between um, the two kind of the two sides, if you will, because of this whole free love question. What happens next? So this is where we're going to go beyond the 1870s, just to kind of join it up in brief with kind of the, the higher uh, or the better known uh, aspect into the, the 20th century. So suffrage bills and amendments continue to be proposed before almost every single legislative session for the rest of the uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. In 1884, the bill passes in the Senate, but not the House. In 1894, women are granted partial suffrage so they can vote in school elections and municipal tax and bond issues. So kind of local or like lady things that, you know, that have to do with schools and children's education. Uh, 1916, uh, it heads to referendum. So that means it did get the two approvals in the legislature, which meant it was eligible for people to vote upon. Uh, but it doesn't pass and everyone's confused as to why this happens. Well. <laughs> They uncovered that thousands of ballots have been cast against it by unregistered voters, which is illegal, but there was no legal recourse to challenge it. So everyone had to accept that a, a rigged election meant that women were not going to vote then. But in 1919, Iowa becomes the 10th state to ratify the 19th Amendment. Uh, Savory and Bloomer's legacy, so neither end up being significantly involved in public women's suffrage eff efforts, excuse me, after 1872. So uh, Louise Noun said that uh, it phrased it as Annie Savory was tarred and feathered by this free love movement. And I think it's a, a good metaphor. Uh, in fact, even at her funeral, uh, her work in women's suffrage was almost completely just glossed over as a way to avoid dredging up that controversy again. It was said, uh, yeah, she spent some time, she spent a little time working on suffrage, but then decided, eh, maybe now is not the right or appropriate time to do that, which is not at all what happened, but uh, it was a way to avoid dredging up all those bad feelings and that controversy. Uh, the Women's Standard, Callanan's paper, so Mar uh, Martha Callanan, uh, she, they, it never actually mentioned Annie Savory at all uh, during her life or even when she died as a, as a show of respect or to, to talk about what she did. Uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton later asked uh, Amelia Bloomer to write a chapter on the history of women's suffrage in Iowa while they were compiling kind of their magnum opus of the history of women's reform work to that time. And Anthony specifically requested Bloomer not fail to do Mrs. Savory full justice. So uh, while she, Annie Savory never served as an officer or uh, on the board of these national groups, what she was doing was definitely noticed. And she did work with 
Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and these national leaders the, whose names you know you know if you're familiar with women's suffrage and they they saw how unfairly uh, her legacy was tarnished or how she was treated by people within the movement. And of course, I want to acknowledge there were a new generation of Iowa leaders that were inspired by uh, these early women reformers, especially uh, the, who we all know and love, Carrie Chapman Catt, of course, uh, joins Iowa suffrage work in 1887, eventually leading the charge nationally toward the 19th Amendment. I know that's the, the shortest synopsis of Carrie Chapman Catt in the history of time, but again, uh, that's kind of outside of what we were talking about here. And there's a lot of resources if anyone is interested in learning more about Carrie Chapman Catt. And I also wanted to recognize uh, Sue M. Wilson Brown, uh, who is president of the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, worked with Polk County Women's Suffrage Association, and she actually established, uh, co established the Des Moines chapter of the NAACP with her husband. So she was a significant uh, African American suffragist here in Des Moines. Uh, Amelia Bloomer. Uh, did a lot of letter writing and, and as much traveling as her health would allow in the in the last few years of her life. And she was interviewed by a reporter who said, if you got the vote, would you actually go cast a ballot? <laughs> Which to me is the most ridiculous question. And she said that too. She said, um, before this in the quote, she said, well, what do you think we were doing <laughs> for these past few years? Um, so, but alas, we pioneers in the cause of women's enfranchisement who have given the best years of our lives to its service are drawing near or have reached and passed our allotted three score and 10 years. And unless men hasten to do us justice, like Joshua of old, we can only view from a distance the promised glory, which our sisters of the future will surely enter upon and enjoy after we have rested from our labors and gone to our reward. And similarly, Carrie Chapman Catt said, it was a continuous, seemingly endless chain of activity. Young suffragists who helped forge the last links of that chain were not born when it began. Old suffragists who forged the first links were dead when it ended. And I just thought that was really touching how both kind of, you have Carrie Chapman Cat and Amelia Bloomer both commenting on this idea mm -hmm. that it really took two entire generations for this work to be done, in quotation marks, but to achieve that goal of, of women's suffrage at a federal level. So I wanted to share a couple of resources, particularly ones that meant a lot to me or were very helpful. So Strong Minded Women, The Emergence of the Women's Suffrage Movement in Iowa by Louise Noun, published in 1969, is available at the Des Moines Public Library. Um, Amelia Bloomer, a biography by Louise Noun is in the Annals of Iowa, which are back issues are all available online for free. Uh, so it's you can just search <coughs> Amelia Bloomer. But the information that I talked about today is located in the second half, which is the time in Iowa. The first half is her time in New England. Annie Savory, a voice for women, women's rights by Louise, also by Louise Noun, is in the Annals of Iowa, volume 44, available online. Um, Carrie Chapman, Cat Warrior for Women, the PBS documentary, uh, was made in 2020, and it's available for free to view online. And it does cover some of these early uh, early reformers in brief, early suffragists in brief, since a lot of them ended up, or some of them ended up inspiring uh, and working with Carrie Chapman Catt. And then many of Bloomer and Savering's writings were published in the Des Moines Register and quoted in other papers around the state as well. To see what they were talking about in their own words. That is the end. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> yes. Was there a reason that they didn't, that there was a year in between before they could, you know, like, ratify? They only, they only meet yeah, every yep, they did years. not meet annually. Oh. So uh, it, it was that much time between each meeting. So, and so that means if it didn't pass the second time, you know, it would be another four years at the earliest before it could even potentially be up to a vote. So that's one reason why it took so long, I think, because it was, there's such space between the time it was even possible to get it. Right. Well, if anything else, any other questions, you're welcome to uh, come up and ask. Like I said, I do have a copy of that article on um, Avery up here. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to point out that we have a group that's still working very hard today, the League of Women Voters of Iowa, and we have a representative here today who would be more than happy to tell you how to get registered if you don't know. And if you're not registered to vote, 
for shame. We have to, we, when you see how hard women had to fight to get this right, we have got to exercise it. So that's my little liberal sentiment of the day. Um, I wanted to tell you the next Iowa Files will be Sunday, October 15th. It's about Camp Dodge. Uh, during 1917 and 18, Camp Dodge became the largest military base in Iowa's history. So the Gold Star Museum curator, Mike Vogt, will share an illustrated presentation of exploring all the training activities and the history of this amazing place that used to have a huge pool and now doesn't anymore. Um, also want to point out that our fantastic videographer, David, has written a children's history book. He is an educator and decided that there was not enough information out there about the Lusitania, which is arguably one of the key reasons why World War I started. So uh, that all ties in together and David has copies there in the back. I want to thank you for supporting the West Des Moines Historical Society, the West Des Moines Public Library, and everybody else, all of our members and donors. Have a great Sunday.